After my second tour in Iraq, I started having real big problems sleeping, not wanting to be around crowds, just drinking myself numb. I, I contemplated suicide daily, or sometimes even hourly. They, they determined that I was eligible for this study. The first time I'd slept all night was after the first treatment. Wow. The light at the end of the tunnel clicked on. The appeal of the psilocybin project was that it could alleviate some anxiety about death. He said it was, it was like a rocket ship. I think it's gonna actually be a new paradigm in psychiatric medicine. I'm James uh, Harden, and uh, I was a participant of the study on uh, MDMA use for uh, treatment-resistive PTSD. James was diagnosed after doing three tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. I lost that cable. I've been looking around all day. He tried multiple forms of therapy. Is it there? Before signing up for a clinical trial that would use MDMA to treat him. Which session is this? First one. Uh, the way if you want to recreate Iraq, you just take a dog turd and take a hair dryer and point it towards your face. And then, there you go. One of the hardest things to deal with was just the randomness mm -hmm. of it. They, they weren't aiming for a target. They were just aiming to kill us. You know, that night I told my wife, I was like, I, I really think something's happened. MDMA was experimented with for therapeutic purposes in the 1950s, as were other psychedelic drugs like LSD and psilocybin. Studies at the time suggested that these drugs were effective against difficult to treat mental health problems. LSD, to science, it is an uncharted tract on that farthest of all frontiers, the human mind. But in 1970, President Nixon signed the Controlled Substances Act, which prohibited the use of psychedelics for any purpose. Today, thanks to a resurgence in scientific research, psychedelic therapy is making a comeback. The participants who received MDMA, by one year follow-up, two-thirds of them had lost their PTSD diagnosis entirely. MAPS is an organization that funds clinical trials with MDMA and other psychedelic drugs. Dr. Williams is one of the therapists who works with patients like James. MDMA, it's a kind of a psychoactive drug. Therapists found that uh, it was really helpful for people to be able to access uh, some different types of feelings and experiences that they'd had trouble talking about before. You probably think about ecstasy or molly when you think about MDMA, but the drug used in these trials is made specifically for therapeutic use. Come on in. All clinical trials involving psychedelics follow a strict protocol, and patients are heavily screened. How long do those sessions last? The MDMA sessions are six to eight hours each. That sounds exhausting. <laughs> yeah. Do you prompt them or? Well, actually, the therapy tends to be non-directive. When I try, try to think back now about the experiences, it's a little bit more detailed. There's, there's quite a few times uh, in here where I'm just not saying anything at all. But that didn't mean that I wasn't thinking through things. The therapists are more of a supportive role in terms of engaging with the participant around whatever material uh, they happen to bring. Direct yourself inside occasionally. Mm -hmm. Why do you think MDMA is has been so effective for something like PTSD? Revisiting those thoughts makes them very anxious and so the medication um, brings down a lot of that fear and anxiety so that they can approach those um, those memories without fear and distress and increases the trust for the therapist so they feel more open processing those experiences with another person. MDMA increases the release of serotonin in your brain and increases the hormone oxytocin. So when taken in a clinical setting, it can get patients to open up. The drug, it pretty much it disarmed me from all the worries and, and fears. The drug and the therapy together had, uh, I, I was talking about things that I typically wouldn't have ever really sh shared with strangers. No, imagine it all just kind of evaporating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there he is. So he was just sitting next to you? Mm -hmm. he, he did his job that day. He, he sat there beside me the, the whole time. How many treatments did you do? A uh, total of three. It seemed like after the, the second one, uh, the third one was just kind of like uh, doing a little bit of housekeeping. <laughs> great timing, Yogi. Great, great. Felt like uh, I'd been given another chance, another life. I started going on hikes again, uh, just walks, going out in the crowds. 
In 2017, the FDA granted this treatment a breakthrough designation, and now MAPS is lobbying to make MDMA a prescription medication. But this could take several years. How did you feel hearing that? For the longest time, it's, you know, since I've done the study, I, I, I like to say that it felt like I had the cure for cancer in my back pocket, but I, nobody else could have it. James says MDMA therapy gave him his life back, but psychedelics can also help alleviate anxiety at the end of life. If you could describe Patrick in a sentence, what would you say about him? Curious man of action. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a superhero. I know, that, that's really what he was. How did you two meet? Fairy tale moment, um, Barnes and Noble on 85th Street. I was reaching for a book, um, and this other hand was reaching for the same book at the same moment. And that was Patrick. <laughs> yeah. One Sunday morning, I rolled over and, and his eyes were yellow, jaundiced. That was the beginning. And so what was he eventually diagnosed with? It's cancer of the bile duct. Shortly before he died, Patrick made Lisa a slideshow of pictures from their last vacation together. So I'm a little embarrassed. I'm bathing <laughs> suit. He loved that. <laughs> and he was being racked by the chemo. And, and often he would lay on the couch and just go, you know, this is killing me. This is really killing me. Did you find out about the therapy at the same time or? Mm -hmm. New York Times article. How did you feel when he showed interest? I just wanted him to live. And I felt that the study was for people that were gonna die. And he wasn't gonna die, <laughs> according to me. And how did you feel um, when he came home from the treatment. He looked like he had run a marathon. He looked exhausted, but he also had this kind of like open-eyed wonder look on his face. I could tell something really momentous had happened, and I think he became more accepting through the experience of, of the drug. If someone were to ask you just in general about the treatment, what would you say? If it can give you the kind of good death that my husband had. It's immeasurably important, immeasurably. The psilocybin experience for Patrick really fostered in kind of a greater acceptance of the end of life. I was saying goodbye for what I knew was the last time, and it was difficult for me. And he stood up with this wonderful grin and just said, it's gonna be okay. Dr. Bosses is an expert in palliative care and is a guide for cancer patients who undergo psilocybin therapy. He worked with Patrick. Why is it important to have a good death? Well, you want a bad death? <laughs> we don't want to suffer at the end. And so a good death is about having a sense of completion and acceptance and dignity. And but we don't die that well in America. We die in, in ICUs with tubes and trying to get one more week or 10 more days or a few more months. And so quality matters. It's so one of the hardest things to get at in terms of treating people with cancer and at the end of life is that emotional suffering. So that this medicine could reliably trigger this mystical experience or peak experience and really reduce that suffering was incredible. Psilocybin is the main ingredient in psychoactive mushrooms. Its structure is similar to serotonin and it binds with it and can cause hallucinations. Researchers who work with it say it gives you insight into your subconscious. What is the experience that, that people have? The way I describe it often is like pulling the lens back and they begin to transcend and see themselves, their suffering, their cancer, their very existence from a much, much larger perspective. And Patrick rated it as the single most spiritually significant experience of his life. Patrick journaled extensively about his trip and he described the experience as being in a rocket ship. He wrote that there had been no sensation, no image of beauty, nothing during my time on earth that has felt as pure and joyful and glorious as the height of this journey. Test, test, one, two, one, two. You got me? <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's one of the nicer ones in the area. It's the only yeah. uh, air-conditioned hangar, uh, like, in the <laughs> really? entire area. It's nice, yeah. CJ, what does the back of your shirt say? Oh, here. It's, uh, Aviation Mechanics Creed. Come on in. That's like the puzzles that I like to solve. I, I, I find it uh, rewarding every time I, I get to do something like this. That was it. Whoa. That was the repair. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> There's some weeks where maybe you try to chase a problem the whole week and you just can't find it. I call it uh, gremlins. Uh, so it's, it's attention to detail and you know, that's uh, you know, the point where I'd say I didn't have that before. Uh, I was too busy fighting the gremlins in my own head uh, rather than you know, in here. And these seem to be a little bit easier to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to your treatment, did you feel like you were able to sort of do work like this or? No, I, I didn't have the, uh, the attention span at that point. I actually look forward to coming to work every day. Is there anything that you hope will happen in the future in relation to these kinds of therapies? Well, uh, I mean, they're going in the phase three trials right now. Then uh, it'll go on to hopeful reclassification with the DEA. So that is my, my absolute hope because it'll open up uh, so many doors for so many people. The FDA is recognizing that this is a treatment that has a lot of promise. There are critics. I spoke to Glenn Hansen at the University of Utah, recommended by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. He says the patients are extremely fragile and their responses can be unpredictable and sensitive to behavioral management. He's also concerned about the side effects. What would you say to anybody who is skeptical of this kind of treatment? Well, I would encourage them to read the journal articles and look at the science. We were on the palliative care floor of Mount Sinai. There were, you know, a lot of chronically ill, terribly ill people that were passing on all around us, and I don't think they had such good deaths. Anybody who's dealing with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, I know it seems like it's an a unbearable weight and that there is, you know, there's not a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but I'd say that there, there is, it just might just be around the corner where you don't see it yet.